Good morning. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. According to our earliest gospel, the Gospel of Mark, Jesus began his ministry at the Sea of Galilee. What brought him there? And why were the first disciples he recruited from the fishing industry? I'm reading from the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother, John, in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. We know that Jesus was trained in carpentry, and it is very likely that he left Nazareth to work as an itinerant laborer, traveling along the coast from harbor to harbor. In the Gospel of Mark, it was the city of Capernaum, a major harbor and an important center of the fishing trade that Jesus gravitated to at the beginning of his ministry. There would have been plenty of construction work. According to the scholar Casey Hansen, the role of Galilean fishing has been severely underrated for its impact on Jesus' network, locations of operation, aphorisms, parables, and acts of power. And indeed, a close reading of the Gospel reveals that Jesus' proclamation of God's reign was initially directed to the Galilean fishing villages and towns. It might also explain the contempt shown to his ministry by the elites in Jerusalem. Having made his residence in Capernaum, Jesus is seen to be traveling up, down, and across the Sea of Galilee. No wonder then that the lives of these real fishing families became the fabric from which he wove many of his metaphors and told his stories. Think of the accounts that portray Jesus' teaching at the shore or from the boat, calming the storm, feeding the 5,000, walking on the sea, and finally appearing to the disciples as the resurrected Christ back at the shore where it all began. Bread and fish were regarded as God's good gifts. The first fish caught would carry a coin in its mouth to pay taxes and not cause any offense. The fishing net and the wondrous catch of fish served as parables of the kingdom of God. Mountains, trees, and millstones were to be thrown into the sea as evidence of faith or judgment. And Jonah's big fish became an important sign of Jesus' death and resurrection. The Sea of Galilee presented Jesus with a rich resource from which to draw inspiration for his teachings. It enabled him to craft a ministry that spoke directly to the socio-political challenges of his audience. For along its shore, there were several villages which were all connected with the local fishing industry, which was the most important sector of Galilee's economy. But during Jesus' ministry, the fishing industry was undergoing dramatic changes. Those changes began after Caesar Augustus' death in 14 Common Era, when Tiberius became the new Roman emperor. To gain his favor, the client king Tetrarch of Galilee, Herod Antipas, initiated the building of a new capital city called Tiberias, situated right at the shores of the Sea of Galilee. This was Antipas' way of showing his loyalty to the new ruler in Rome. The building of Tiberias was to be part of a bigger process to bring the region under the authority and influence of Rome. The city was to become an administrative and military center, and Antipas built his royal palace there. 
it was very likely that John the Baptist was beheaded right there. Chet Myers points out, and I quote, the primary function of the city was to regulate the fishing industry around the Sea of Galilee, putting it firmly under the control of Roman interests. Hansen highlights that fishing was an important part of the Galilean economy in the first century. But it was not the free enterprise which modern readers of the New Testament may imagine. Even those who may have owned their own boats were part of a state-regulated elite profiting enterprise and a complex web of economic relationships. In fact, it is the political economy of the fishing industry around the Sea of Galilee that provided the matrix of oppression in Mark's Gospel. The fishing industry was increasingly restructured to supply the distant markets throughout the empire. In order to guarantee a steady export, the industry became state-regulated, benefiting first of all the urban elite. Such state regulation was in the hands of Jews connected to the Thoreaudian family and in the hands of those Greeks or Romans who in the wake of the military conquest started to settle in Palestine. They controlled the sale of fishing leases. The brothers Simon and Andrew and the Zebedee family we are introduced to in the first chapter of Mark's Gospel must have been one of the local kinship-based cooperatives to whom such fishing rights were awarded. Individuals were not granted such leases and therefore were not allowed to fish. Apart from having to pay for those leases, the cooperatives had to pay taxes on the processed fish products and incurred further loss of income by tolls levied on the transport of those products. Levi, the son of Alpheus, mentioned early in Mark's Gospel, was one of the local administrators who handled those at times exorbitant leases, taxes and tolls. We can see how this radical transformation of the local fishing economy led to the marginalization and impoverishment of formerly self-sufficient fishing families. Fish, a dietary staple, was now extracted mainly for export. And fishers were far from classed as entrepreneurs, but found themselves at the bottom of the economic hierarchy. The Roman poet Cicero reveals the full extent of social contempt fishermen suffered when he notes, and the most shameful occupations are those which cater to our sensual pleasures. Fish sellers, butchers, cooks, poultry raisers, and fishermen, as Terence said. The remnants of a first century fishing boat discovered in 1985 at the bottom of the Sea of Galilee reveals the extent of the hard life fishermen must have suffered. The boat had both oars and a sail and was made to carry up to 13 people. Archaeological research has shown that it must have been rebuilt at least five times using seven different kinds of wood in the constant process of patching it up. It indicates what has been described as a cannibalization of other boats. In fact, this particular boat must have been deemed irreparable at some stage. But before it was discarded into the sea, all reusable material was removed. It is a remarkable artifact, most likely from the time of Jesus. It is symbolic of the hardship and poverty suffered by Jesus' first disciples. It should therefore not surprise us that according to Mark, fishermen were Jesus' first converts. His alternative social vision must have spoken to their enormous plight. They had little to lose and must have been attracted to Jesus' radical critique of the status quo. The coastal city of Capernaum not far from Herod's capital city of Tiberias, became the place from where Jesus began to recruit his followers for a movement that would resist such exploitation and develop the vision for a more egalitarian society. 
Chet Myers compares those beginnings to Gandhi's mobilization of the untouchable classes in India with his famous salt march, and to Martin Luther King's commitment to stand with the sanitation workers of Memphis in 1968. The kingdom of God had arrived at the Sea of Galilee, and the sea with its shores, boats, and fish became the place where Jesus staged a peaceful revolt that continues to steer and inspire us. And Jesus said to them, come, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Traditionally, this saying of Jesus has been interpreted as a call to save souls. But Chet Myers warns us not to take the phrase out of context and to rather understand it within the social metrics we've discussed in the first part. What does it mean to leave one's nets and to fish for people in a context of economic exploitation. Since both John the Baptist and Jesus understood their ministry in continuity with Israel's prophetic tradition, it will be important to understand how the metaphor of fishing for people is used in no less than four prophetic oracles in the Hebrew Scriptures. In the book of Jeremiah, God's verdict on those whose idolatry has led to the neglect of the poor and destitute is biting. Fishermen, and hunters are recruited to bring justice to the land. Fishing becomes an exercise of clearing the waters of ruthless predators. But now I will send for many fishermen, declares the Lord, and they will catch them. After that, I will send for many hunters, and they will hunt them down on every mountain and hill and from the crevices of the rocks. My eyes are on all their ways, they are not hidden from me, nor is their sin concealed from my eyes. In the book of Amos, the imagery of fishing becomes even more graphic. The sovereign Lord has sworn by his holiness, the time will surely come when you will be taken away with hooks, the last of you with fish hooks. The book of Ezekiel, presents us with a damning judgment of Egypt's pharaoh, confronting the empire's delusion of claiming the river Nile as its possession. One cannot help but think of how Herod Antipas laid claim on the resources of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus called Herod a fox, using cunning and deceit to secure his power. Ezekiel, visualizes Egypt's pharaoh as a monstrous crocodile whose days are counted. I'm against you, pharaoh king of Egypt, you great monster, 
lying among your streams. You say the Nile belongs to me. I made it for myself, but I will put hooks in your jaws and make the fish of your stream stick to your scales. I will pull you out from among your streams with all the fish sticking to your scales. I will leave you in the desert, you and all the fish of your streams. You will fall on the open field and not be gathered or picked up. I will give you as food to the beasts of the earth and the birds of the sky. And finally, in the book of Habakkuk, we witness the painful lament of those suffering oppression. We hear the heartfelt call for God to intervene and hold accountable those who use their nets for ruthless enrichment. This time, those suffering exploitation I imagine to be the very fish in the sea on which greedy and selfish rulers prey. You've made people like the fish in the sea, like the sea creatures that have no ruler. The wicked foe pulls all of them up with hooks. He catches them in his net. He gathers them up in his dragnet. And so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore he sacrifices to his net and burns incense to his dragnet. For by his net he lives in luxury and enjoys the choicest food. Is he to keep on emptying his net, destroying nations without mercy? Jesus' use of the metaphor of fishing for people is evocative, a provocation that creates a net of rich associations aimed at catching out those willing to sacrifice the livelihood of hard-pressed fishermen and their families. The privatization of the Sea of Galilee's commonwealth has robbed people of their basic source of income. Jesus' intentional play of words allows the readers of the gospel to revisit their plight in the light of Israel's long history of oppression. The God Jesus has come to proclaim clearly identifies with their suffering. The prophetic writings make room for both lament and hope. Jesus taps into that ancient wisdom and embodies it for a new context. He summons his disciples to move beyond the role of powerless victims and to harness the power of Israel's prophetic vision of justice. Jesus' call to fish for people is far from innocent. It is about catching some big fish. It is not about saving people's souls from damnation, but rescuing those held in the grip of paralyzing economic uncertainty. It is extraordinary how Jesus begins his call to discipleship with nothing less than a clear message to those responsible for systemic injustice. God is on the way to catch you out and hold you accountable. And so Jesus mobilizes the wretched of the earth to raise their voice and confront the selfish and corrupt ambitions of the political elite. But such an enterprise is not without serious risks. Remember how John the Baptist exposed Herod Antipas for divorcing his wife and unlawfully taking the wife of his brother? Blowing the whistle on Herod and holding him accountable led to John's imprisonment and beheading. This was Herod's way of dealing with someone who was seen to sow seeds of rebellion and resistance to empire. Mark tells us that Simon and Andrew, James and John, immediately left their nets and followed Jesus. Leaving their fishing business meant risking the economic security of their extended families. It was a bold step, without doubt, but also one of desperation, for what did they have to lose? Chet Myers is spot on when he interprets their decision as an uncompromising break with business as usual. It was a radical departure. The Greek verb aphiemi, employed to describe such leave-taking, keeps returning in Mark's gospel, connoting the release from debt and the forgiveness of sins. In each case, the verb is used to describe the liberation 
from bondage and the embrace of a new freedom. Note how the tax collector Levi, the son of Alphaeus, someone who collaborated with imperial Rome, became a disciple of Jesus' movement, committed to creating a community that practices solidarity and economic redistribution. Martin Luther King spoke about the struggle for the soul of America. The Jesus movement struggled for the soul of Israel. And ours should be a struggle for the soul of South Africa. Indeed, the gospel has always been and will always have to be both personal and political. Please remember the Defend Our Democracy campaign, which is busy recruiting more fisherwomen and fishermen across South Africa. A big thank you to all the whistleblowers and journalists who make sure that the big fish are caught and held accountable. Yours is truly a prophetic ministry and your courage inspires us. And so, as you leave from here, may God bless us all with prophetic vision, the courage to raise our voice and the freedom to leave our nets. Amen. Thank you.